Take your Bibles here. I think I'm going to change my text all of a sudden. I'm going to read a verse to you in just a second, but I'm going to change the story. I was going to read a different part of the Bible, and then I was going to tell the story. But I think I'm, I think I'm going to go ahead and re- we're going to read it together. So take your Bibles and look in the Bible in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. It's in the Old Testament. It's after the major prophets. Daniel's a famous prophet. It's right after the book of Ezekiel. It's in the Old Testament. Does anybody have a pew Bible? What page, Seth? It's on page 652. Page 652 if, you have a, if you have a Bible out of, the, out of the pew. It's going to be right in the neighborhood. In fact, if you have just a regular Bible like Jennifer, it's going to be around there somewhere. And it's got it's around there. It's page 652, Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Well, if you'd read your Bible every day, you might be able to find Daniel a little bit faster. Amen. I mean, Daniel's sort of like a well known book. You're still flipping pit. Now, the other day, I couldn't find whatever it was I was looking for. What was I looking for? Jonah. That's right. And uh, I should have been able to find it quicker. But um, Daniel, that's everybody. I don't know where Daniel is. Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. And we'll uh, sort of want to tell the whole story, but we're going to start at verse 10 because I'll have you stand in here for longer than, than probably you want to. So. You know, if you look in the book of Ezra, you can see, though, the Bible says where they stood up, they made a pulpit of wood, and Ezra, nine other men on the pulpit with him, on the platform with him, and they stood on a platform made of wood, raised above the people, they made a pulpit of wood, and they had all his uh, other guys up there, and Ezra stood up and read the Bible to them, read the law. The Bible says that he read the Bible for three hours in a driving rainstorm, and all the people, old people, young people, kids, everybody, stood there and listened as Ezra read the Bible. That means he read Leviticus. That means he read Genesis. That means he read Numbers. That means he read Deuteronomy. And he read the Bible. And and nowadays we got little kids can't sit still for 20 minutes. And it's because the parents don't train the kid. It's because they sit in front of the TV all day. And I'm not going to get off on that right now. But your child, I mean, if you've got a four, five, six, four, four-year-old kid, that kid ought to be able to sit in church for 45 minutes and not squirm around, not have to get up and not, when you try and make it sit still, if you take that kid out and lift him up about six feet in the air and say, listen, son, I'll throw you out and I'll, you're going to regret the day you met me if you don't sit down and shut up and we're in the house of God. You understand me, boy? Oh, that's child abuse. Yeah, and you're going to let it grow up and be, be a little. It's going to be, here's what's going to happen. It's going to go to school and it's going to have attention deficit disorder. And they're going to start throwing Ritalin down his throat until it's, until it's a brain, until its brain is corroded. Until it's curled up on the edges like cheese left out on the counter. Amen. I don't know. I don't think they had ADDS in Ezra's day. Amen. They had woodshed in Ezra's day. And we need woodshed in our day, too. Now, so when the people stood up to read the Bible, and the people stood up to read the Bible, and then the Bible says, as he, as he read the Bible, all the people said, Amen. Amen. All the people said, Amen. And I'm not trying to get to say amen. I'm just saying it's a, it's a, it's a biblical thing. <gasps> Those people said amen. Man, I went to a church one time in Arizona. What was the name of that city? Winslow, Arizona? No, not Winslow, Arizona. Uh, and some little town, Kingman, Arizona, I think. I led an Indian to Christ. His name was Jerry Chi. And after the service, uh, he was just sitting there, and he had two little girls in Sunday school. And I went up and asked him if he was saying, and he wasn't saying. I led him to Christ sitting in this Baptist church. I went in this Baptist church. I was traveling to a wedding in Texas. It was in the summer of 1991. I was traveling from Northern California to Eastern Texas. That was stupid. Drove 4,000 miles in three days and went to a wedding beside. And um, uh, to go to Texas and back, and I stopped in Arizona on a Sunday morning to go to church. And the uh, they sat there. I said, amen. The guy said, Jesus or something. I said, amen. Everybody in that church turned around and looked at me. I'm not exaggerating. Man. I mean, I didn't say amen. All. I didn't stand up and whoop and yell and everything else. He just said something about Jesus. And I said, amen. And I mean, several people turned around and looked at me like, you know, wow, is he okay? Or is something going to happen right here? We've never seen this before. And uh, so I said, well, I guess I won't say anything. And then for a few seconds, I thought, well, I guess I won't say anything. And I thought, you know, I'm going to stir this service up. And uh, so every, I said amen about 20 times. The guy said, I'd say amen, preacher, amen. God looked at me like, what did I say? Back up and say it again. Amen, preacher, that's good. What, I must have said something he liked, you know, and say it again. And uh, in the church, men ought to say amen. amen. You say, well, I'm just that's not my nature. Well, get right with God and it'll be your nature. Amen. You say, that's just not my personality type. Well, what are you, type B for bland? <laughs> type B for boring? Or are you type D for dead, Amen. Be type A for alive, okay? 
I mean, you, you know, amen just means so be it. That's right. It's in the book, and it'll help you. It'll encourage you. All right? All right. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3 and verse number 9. I changed my scripture. I reserve the right. Daniel chapter 3, verse 9. Daniel 3, verse 9. If you found that, would you stand, please, out of respect for the word of God, and thank God you're not in a rainstorm. Amen? Daniel chapter 3 and verse 9. Then, uh, let's see, Daniel chapter 3, verse 9. They spake and said, verse 8, Wherefore at that time certain called Chaldeans, Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. Whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews who now set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They have not served thy gods, nor worshipped the golden image that thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, Shadrach, o Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do ye not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, but psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour in the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful, and that means we don't give a flip, that's what that means. We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, but, but if not, but if he doesn't deliver us, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now there's still some story to it to be to finish reading, but we're not going to read it. We're going to stop right there, and I'll preach to you, and we'll get to it in a second. Father, we love you. We ask you to bless the message today, the special music, the sermon, all that we do, help it to be done for thee. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Let me read another scripture to you, and I'm going to use an introduction using another scripture, and we'll come back to what we just read in Daniel 3. But the Bible speaks about a decision and the Bible says in the book of Joel, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And that's where most people stay. They stay in this valley of decision. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. I'm big on decisions. I, I like, I like, I have a principle I live by, a way I make decisions. I don't make a lot of decisions because what I did is many years ago I made some decisions and I made those decisions and those decisions govern my decisions. Decisions that I made years ago make my decisions for me now, put it that way. I made a decision a long time ago. I wrote down some things. It's a different sermon and it's kind of old. I think I've told you this before, but I made a decision a long time ago to honor my mother and father. Now, you heard about my mother and father. I made a decision to honor them. So when I get around any of my brothers and sisters, I begin to dishonor them and, and bring up things out of the past, which, you know, I don't even know if half what they say is true or not. I, I don't get involved in the conversation. I refuse to. I won't listen to it. And it's caused, it's caused friction in our family between my siblings and I because I, I made a decision a long time ago. I will not dishonor my parents. I made a decision a long time ago to stay married. Now, I didn't decide that when I first got married. I didn't walk down the aisle when I got married and say, okay, I'm going to stay married. But after about a couple of months of being married, I made a decision to stay married. And some of you guys think you got bad marriages, man. If, you, if you'd been around my wife and I, <laughs> we were first married last night. The clock wouldn't go out. The clock was bu it buzzed real loud, and I was adjusting the side of it and trying to get the buzz. I mean, when it goes off, it sounds like you know an air raid siren. And I was trying to get it to fix it to where it doesn't buzz so loud. And she said, is that the clock I broke? Miss Jackson's in there. She said, is that the clock I brought? I said, oh, you mean the one you threw at me? I said, no, honey, that's not that clock. You threw another, there was another clock you threw at me. She said, well, how'd that clock get broke? I said, I broke that one. And, you know, pastor and his wife, they're such a good couple, and they're always so happy. 
pastor and his wife are two human beings, stubborn, hot-headed people like you. Maybe worse, maybe not as worse, maybe not as bad, I don't know. But we made a decision that we were going to stay married. I made a decision to honor my parents. I made a decision to stay true to the principles of the men who taught me in the ministry. As you'll see, you see all these men on the wall. I've learned a lot from a lot of them. I've not met many of them. I met a few of them. You know, I've met several of them. But um, I just made a decision to be true to what I learned. So that means if, if Jack Hiles, Brother Jack Hiles, if he goes bad, if he goes wrong, I'm still okay. Because I didn't make a decision to follow Jack Hiles. I made a decision to obey the principles that I learned a long time ago. So it doesn't matter. If Brother Hiles decides that... Uh, that you get saved by being baptized, I won't. I won't change. I don't have to change my mind because I decided a long time ago you get saved by faith in Christ, Amen. and I made some decisions. And if the Bible says multitudes, multitudes in the in the valley of decision. Now I've got about five page outline. I'm going to preach till about ten after. So listen carefully. For many years now, in the book of Joel, we're, I'm talking, bringing this scripture out of the book of Joel. For many years now, God had been calling His people, Israel, to return unto Him. First, he'd sent many wars amongst them. They'd not returned. Then civil wars, and they'd not returned. He sent them to a Babylonian captivity. They still had not returned. He'd sent them famine. They'd not returned unto him. He'd sent them uh, plenty. They'd not returned. He'd sent them drought. They'd not returned. He'd sent them prophets to preach. They'd not returned. He sent them uh, a pestilence and captivity, but they had not returned. Some had returned with their whole heart, and some had stubbornly rebelled, but most were still undecided. These that were undecided or on the fence, these were those in the valley of decision. The Bible says multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Now, people in this room today, I can't point at you and say, you're this person or you're this person or you're this person or you're this person. Or, I can't, I don't know where you are in your heart, but I promise you this. So in, in a group of a hundred people, uh, uh, 10 will be this way and 10 will be this way. And 80 will be right. What I'm talking about today in the Valley of decision. I promise you this, all the teenagers in this room today, some of you are, many of you are in the Valley of decision. Some aren't, some are, some have decided with your heart. I'm not going to go God's way. I'm going to rebel against God. God. Some, a few of you have decided I will go God's way. I'm going to follow God. But many of you are in the valley of decision, not just teenagers, but adults also. And the Bible says that he, the question was, it came to him, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. What does that mean? They simply couldn't decide if they were going all out. The decision was, was God going to be their God? Would they serve God or idols? Would they serve true, the true God or false gods? Would they be a self-sacrificing individual or would they live for materialism? Would they be faithful or would they be unfaithful? Would they be honest or would they not? Would they tithe or would they not? The Bible doesn't say, also, I want you to notice this. The Bible doesn't say they were in the valley of decisions. They were in the valley of decision, singular. By the way, the message is called Stop Deciding and Decide. Stop deciding and decide. Stop getting up every day and deciding, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, whichever way the wind blows. Things turn out good today, I'll be, I'll, you know, I, the Bible says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable on thy side, O Lord, my strength and redeemer. And that should be our prayer every day. That should be our walk every day. Every day of our life, this, behold, this is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. One day a man was uh, uh, over in Scotland. He was walking down a road. It was pre-dawn, and another man met him coming this way. And he said, "Yo," he said, uh, "Oh, friend, are you from this uh, area, part of the country?" He said, uh, "Yes, sir, I am." He said, uh, "Can you tell me what kind of day it'll be today, weather-wise?" He said, "It'll be a beautiful day." He said, "Really?" Uh, with the rain and the mist, he said. How can you tell to be a beautiful day? And the, the Scottish man said, because the Lord has made this day, and whatever kind of day the Lord makes, it'll be a good day to me. Amen. Behold, this is the day the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice. Not, not uh, we're going to rejoice because it's a beautiful day, but we're going to rejoice because the Lord made the day, and the Lord said rejoice in it. And the Bible says get a, a decision in the valley of decision. The Bible doesn't say valley of decisions, but valley of decision. God was saying to the people, and this is what exactly what God, this is not the interpretation by Doug Jackson. And this is the Bible interpretation, what God was preaching and teaching these people. And he came to the prophet Joel, and he said, God said to the people,
people make a decision to follow me or not. Because if you decide to follow God, we stand here and blithely sing, or uh, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And then at 530 on Sunday night, we get out the remote and get the big bowl of popcorn and stay home from church. Why don't you shut your lying mouth and don't sing that song? Amen. Now, I'm not trying to be confrontational. I don't want to be confrontational. I hate con con confrontation. I can't stand it. But stop saying something that you don't believe. Oh, now, if you're one of those people right now say, oh, is he preaching to me? You're one of those 80 in the middle. Some of you say, that's right. I ain't coming to church. I don't even know why I'm sitting here right now. Others say, bless God, I'll be here every time the door's open. But others of you say, well, I just have to decide every time. I just have to make a decision. Will I go to church or not? God said, make a decision to follow me or not. In Joshua chapter 24, the people had to decide. Joshua said, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. In Exodus 32, 36, the people had to decide. Moses said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. In 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21, Elijah told the people to decide. He said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal be God, follow him. But choose you this day. How long halt ye between two opinions? Is it right to live the Christian life or is it not? Then if it's right to live the Christian life, make the decision and live the Christian life. Is it right to go to church? Is it right to read your Bible? Is it right to pray? Is it right to tithe? Is it right to go soul winning? Is it right to forgive your enemies? Is it right to walk with God? Is it right to do right? Is it right to not to set no wicked thing before your eye? Is it right to do these things? If it's right to do these things, then then uh, according to Elijah, Elijah the prophet said, folks, if Baal be God, follow him. But if God be God, follow him. How long halt ye between two opinions? And I'm going to tell you, he was talking to a bunch of people that were sitting on the fence. And they and the, you know what the Bible says? I love this. The people said the people answered him not a word. You know why? They're waiting to see what happened. Well, let's see. Let's see who's God. If Baal answers by fire and consumes a sacrifice, uh, then we're going to serve Baal. If God answers by fire and consumes a sacrifice that Elijah had put out there, then we're going to serve Elijah. Don't wait till God has to send fire to consume the sacrifice in your life to decide God's God. Amen. Chances are you won't get this sacrifice. You won't get the prayers answered if you don't decide God's God. If you're waiting, well, which way is the wind going to blow today? What does the, what will the society say today? What does the world think today? I don't care what the world thinks. I don't care what society thinks. I decided 18 years ago God was God in the valley of decision that I made a decision I would follow God. And that's exactly what these three Hebrew boys did right here. Book of Matthew, Jesus said, follow me. In the book of John, Jesus told Peter, follow me. Now, four points and some things to say about those points. Number one, decide if something is right. Now, listen, let me say this. The Bible says that all Scripture is given, inspiration, is profitable for doctrine, for rebuke, for instruction uh, in righteousness, and uh, uh, encouragement. Or another one. What's the other one? Reproof. Today's message is a I want it to be an encouragement. It's not a rebuke. It's not a reproof. It's an encouragement. I want to encourage you that you serve a living Savior. Amen. I want to encourage you that God is on the throne. That God is taking care of everything. Amen. God always runs on time. God never runs late. God never is going to let, not out of never let anything that comes to you that can hurt you had to be filtered through the love of God. If it comes to you and hurts you, it came through the love of God. Don't get mad at God and say, I'm going to decide that God's no good. No, it came from God to help you. I want to encourage you today that your God is a great God and he's worthy to be served. Amen. There's no rebuke today, no reproof today, no correction today, an encouragement, an instruction today. Number one, decide if something is right to be right. Pretty simple, isn't it? Not complicated. Decide if it's right, and then do right. Decide if the Bible's right, then read it. Decide if alcohol is wrong, and then and then uh, 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 don't abstain from it. Don't drink it. 
Decide if it's right to go to church every week and then do it. Decide if it's right to tithe, then do it. If you decide in every situation, if every situation that comes along, you have to decide, you have to decide, you have to decide, you have a 50-50 chance of being wrong. A 50-50 chance of being wrong. If you have to decide every time something happens, every time you and your wife are getting along, well, it's wonderful. We're going to decide to stay together. And then you and your wife are having a fight. Well, it's terrible. You know what? This is sad, too. The United States, the divorce statistics are over 50%, and it's getting that way in churches. What in heaven's name is wrong with us? What in heaven's name? I'm working on something right now called What on Earth is Wrong with Us? I got all kinds of things. What in heaven is wrong with us? Nothing. What in heaven is wrong with us? Nothing. What on earth? Lots of things. What is wrong with us, though, as Christian people, where we let the I can understand if you're lost and things happen in your life and stuff, marriage problems. But man, once you get saved, and that's supposed to change. Hello? And you know, if you got marriage problems, you can still say that's right. Now decide if something's right to do right. If you decide in every situation, there'll be a 50-50 chance of you being wrong. Number one, and don't think all the points will be this quick. Uh, this quick. Num point number one, decide if something is right to do right. Point number two, decide then according to the Word of God. Not according to what you think, not according to what the latest book said. Decide according to the Word of God. That's exactly where the decision comes in. Will you allow the book to be your authority? When we choose to follow God, we must choose to follow the book. Anybody uh, who could be in church this morning and wasn't chose to disobey the Bible. Hello? Hello? Could have been here and weren't chose to disobey the Bible. Anybody who can be here tonight and isn't chose to disobey the book. Anybody who can be here tonight and isn't chose to disobey the book. Whatever happened to seek ye first the kingdom of God? But whatever happened to that scripture? Do we, we cut that out of the Bible? Did we cut Matthew 6, uh, uh, 34 out of the Bible? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Did we cut that out of the Bible? Whatever happened to uh, Matthew 6, uh, I think it's Matthew 6, 10, not my will, but thy will be done? What happened to that verse? What happened to that verse? Is that in your Bible? It's in my Bible. Whatever happened to the first commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, all thy strength. Thou shalt have no other gods before him. Whatever happened to that verse? Whatever happened to the verse, honor me, if you honor me, I'll honor you. He that honoreth me, I'll honor. Whatever happened to the verse, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. What happened to those verses? Are they not in the Bible anymore? Have I been reading a, a, a out-of-date version or what? Whatever happened to not my will, but thy will be done? This book is not a book to take lightly because God clearly spells out what he requires of each, is a, each of us. And if you are in the valley of decision today, make your decision based on the word of God. If God is God, serve him, Elijah said. If he's not, serve Roseanne on your television set. Serve Baal. He said... If it seem evil to you, Joshua said, to serve God, then don't serve him. But if it seems right to serve him, then serve him. Number one, number one, I said, decide if something is right to do right. Number two, decide according to the word of God. Number three, point number three, decide, only four points too. Number three, point number three, almost halfway there. Going out to eat today, I'm hurrying today, man. I'm going out to the country buffet. I've never been to the country buffet. How many of you ever been to the country buffet? I've, ne I've never even, I've heard of it, I've, but I've, I always go to Ryan's up the street. But today I'm going to country buffet, so I want to get this sermon done quickly. Now, when the sermon's over, everybody rush to the altar, get right with God, hurry, get back to your seat, don't shake my hand, race out the door. I want to get to lunch, amen? So uh, you listen carefully as I keep going here, all right? So point number one, decide if something is right to do right. Number two, decide according to the word of God. Number three, decide regardless of how you feel. Everybody gets up and down. Remember I preached a sermon called, I'm a moody person and so are you? I'm a moody person and so are you. I'm a moody person and so are you. You get moody, I get moody. We all get moody. But that's where you make decisions based on not how you feel, but remember, remember our decisions are based on the word of God. Based on the word of God. Uh, everybody gets up and down. Everybody has moods. God knows this. God understands this. That's why God says, get in the value of decision and choose. Decide. If you will decide, listen, if you will decide to follow God, your mood won't affect your decision because the decision has already been made. How many of you are married to a moody person? Would you raise your hand? 
Oh, uh, some of you are correct. Yeah. <laughs> some of you cowards. Everybody, every person that's married ought to raise her hand. You say, well, my wife, she's not very moody. Sometimes she is. My husband, he's not very moody. I, most, a lot of men are very moody these days. Now, I was talking to our Sunday school class about nags, and a bunch of the guys shook their head, and I said, no, I'm talking about men that nag. Hello? I was just talking about you. I always think all the ladies that, you stay out of this lady. All these uh, ladies that, uh, uh, nag, and uh, men are moody. Men can be moody. Uh, it's actually schizophrenia is what it is. Uh, men can be moody, and uh, women can be moody. And God says, don't be, I know you're going to be moody. I know you're going to go through moods. I know sometimes you'll be up. I know sometimes you'll be down. So don't decide uh, in the valley of decision. Don't decide when the decision comes. Decide in the valley of decision, and then your mood won't affect your decision because the decision has already been made. Man, that's good. That's why in Daniel, that's why we read Daniel chapter three. Daniel chapter three. Here, are these three Hebrew boys. They get carted out of Jerusalem. They get taken. There's a big old a war, and Nebuchadnezzar comes over and he snatches them up. He takes all the smart people. That would have left most of us, you know, in Jerusalem. Took all the smart people and the rich people. That would have left all of us. He took the rich people. Took all the smart people and the rich people. He took all the ugly people. So Schultz would have had to go. But he took all the uh, and his boyfriend Lenny, and they would all have to. <laughs> Notice they've been sitting awful close to each other, haven't you? And uh, yeah, I thought so. Uh, and uh, so uh, 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 that's what they did too. They burned guys like you. And uh, so, so they, uh, so they took all the, uh, took all the. Um, uh, you guys messed up my sermon. They took they took all the rich people and all the well educated folk and all the handsome people and of course I had to go. And they took all. Right, and they took I tell you, they took all the bald headed people, so me and Dwayne would have went, and they took all the uh, all the people and they took them over to uh, uh, Babylon, and then they got into Babylon, and they said okay we 're going to train these they 're well educated they 're smart they're they're they 're bright people we 're going to teach them instead of killing them they said we 're going to teach these captive uh, young people we 're going to teach them the ways of babylon we 're going to break bring them up in our our universities we 're going to teach them our science we 're going to teach them our educational system we 're going to teach them about our gods we 're going to teach them our economy, our monetary system. We're going to get them, uh, we're going to um, uh, infiltrate, not the word I want. We're going to not incorporate either, but we're going to, I'll use that word, huh? We're, we're going to, no, not brain. Shut up. Indoctrinate. Thank you, whoever said that. We're going to indoctrinate them into brainwash. <laughs> Somebody needs to wash your brain, all right. And, uh, and uh, we're going to indoctrinate them into our philosophies, and we're going to make these bright young Jewish boys, we're going to make them strong leaders in our nation. That's what they wanted to do. So they brought them over there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and they begin to teach them and train them. And the Bible says in verse 12 that Nebuchadnezzar had set these boys over the affairs of the province. These boys had grown up, young men, in the, uh, uh, in the ways of Babylon, and they had exceeded and excelled. And they were up there in the political structure. These guys were doing okay. These older teenagers, young men, were doing very good in the system. But Nebuchadnezzar had uh, 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 forgotten about one thing, that these boys were saved. These boys were Christians. These boys worshiped God, amen. And he set up a great big idol and said, everybody, hey, look up here and pay attention. And stop looking at your stinking wife or your husband and pay attention. Every week I got to look out there and look at the same people talking to each other, talking to each other. Why don't you just stay home from church and buy the tape? If that's because you, you know what I'm saying. I don't understand it. I, you like the five year old that can't sit still. You can't sit still. I, I, I don't understand it for the life of me. So, so, so they, they, they um, see how moody I am. See, I'm a moody person. I'm a moody person. They, they, so they, they took him over there, and they had him all. And but they were, they were uh, had him all indoctrinated. But they were Christians, and he built a great big idol and said, "You're gonna have to bow down to it." And they, they found out that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't bow down. So in verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar got mad. Ooh, he thought he'd scare him good. He said, in his rage and fury, he said, "Bring those boys up here. Bring those men up here." And he said, "Is it true that you won't worship the image what I've set up?" He said, now, listen, he said, uh, I've set it up, and if, if you're going to go ahead and give up now, if you'll compromise, and if you'll bow down to the image that I set up, I'm going to let you go. Now, I'm going I'm to let you slide now. I know you maybe, maybe you didn't understand it, but if you'll bow down to worship, he said, well. He said, it'll be all right. Well, it'll be all right for you. But he said, if you won't, we're going to cast you into the burning, fiery furnace, and who's the God that shall deliver you out of my hands? And I like verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, said the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. Do you know what they meant? 
You know what they said when they said we are not careful? I mean, we've already made this decision. We made this decision the day you packed us out of Jerusalem. We got away. When we knew you were going to take us and we had heard a word about how you did things, we, we all went to the temple. We went there to the temple and we got on our knees and we said, bless God, I don't care what happens, we ain't bound out. We, we love you, God, and they may take us out of Jerusalem and they may take us to a strange land and they may teach us language, do things to us, but we decide right now we won't bow in that day. So when Nebuchadnezzar said, we're going to throw you in the furnace, if you don't bow, they said, King, we're not careful to answer you. We don't have to think about this. This is not something we have to huddle together and say, come here, come here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what do you think, man? We got a pretty good job, pretty good apartment. Man, we're kind of popular around here. You know, we're going up in the government. Man, come on. Listen, I know what we'll do. In our hearts, we won't bow. We'll just go ahead and bow. Nobody will know, and it won't matter. But in our hearts, we'll still worship God. They didn't say that. They say they didn't get together and try and compromise. They said, we're not careful to answer you, king. We're not bound down to your stupid doll. We're not bound down to your idol. We decided a long time ago when we were in the valley of decision that we won't bow. They said, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. He said this, if it be so, if you throw us in a fiery furnace, if you succeed in doing that, if you do, he said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and out of thy hand, O king. But he, I like this. He said, but if not, but if not, is this too loud? Is that too loud? Yeah. But if not, but if not, it is, but if not, 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 maybe I'm too loud, but if not, we're not going to bow. 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 How about you? What do you do in your valley decision? What do you do when your decisions come along to do right? What do you do when your valley decision? Well, I don't know. I guess nobody will know. Well, they won't miss me at church anywhere. I miss church and they didn't write me a letter and pastor didn't come visit me. <laughs> well, but if not, but if not, in the valley of decision, these teenagers said, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. They said, we don't care what you say. We don't care what you do. We decided a long time ago that we're not going to bow. They made a decision based not on how they felt, based on not on how they would feel. I'm sure they were scared, but based on what they knew was right. They made a decision regardless of how they felt. King got outraged, got furious. Why? Watch this. I'll tell you why the world gets outraged and furious at you. Because the world isn't used to people of conviction. The world's not used to people that stand up for what's right. The world's not used to the people saying, no, I'm not going to hear your dirty jokes. And I could give you a hundred illustrations. Man, I've, I've worked around construction crews. They knew we were from Hiles Anderson. And uh, I'm hanging, hanging a, a garage ceiling, and I got a, a freshman, a senior in high school with me named Kevin Cowling. We're hanging a ceiling. A bunch of guys get in there, and they, they got uh, their music on and playing country music real loud, and they offer us some beer. I said, no, nah, I don't drink beer. Oh, come on. Maybe the boy wants some beer. Nobody will know about it. And I said, man, could you turn that music down? We're in here hanging this guy. No, they, they went over and turned it up. So I took my screw gun and my router and turned them both on. <laughs> turned them around. <laughs> I just said it right there and just let them run as loud as I wanted to. They're not, people aren't used to that. You say, well, I, I ain't, I, man, listen, I won't even say what I, I don't even care. I don't care. I, I, look, you say a hammer, whack. I don't mess with Jack, buddy. I'm a Christian. I'm not backing up. I'm not changing. I decided a long time ago, he loved me. He died for me. He cares for me. And there's nothing in the world, there's no body in the world that'll make me decide to compromise. And there shouldn't be that way with you either. There's no reason to compromise. There's no reason to change. There's no reason to quit. There's no reason to back up. If you're in the valley decision, decide today. Decide today. If God be God, serve him. Amen. If God's not God, don't serve him. God is fair. God says, come, let us reason together. If God's God, serve him. If I'm not God, don't serve me. My wife, last night we were talking. That's a good thing to do. We were talking, and she said, boy, I don't, I don't know where, how it came out, but I said, you know what? It wouldn't matter if I had a million dollars in the bank. It wouldn't help me a bit. If I had $10 million in the bank, you know what? I'd still have to get a sermon for today. You can't buy a sermon. You can't anywhere. If I had $10 million in the bank, Brother Marlon, I'd still have to beg God to help my kids turn out right. 
I could have $50 million. It wouldn't change a thing. It wouldn't change. I'd still have to ask God to help me with my flesh. I'd still have to read the Bible. I'd still have to go door knocking. I'd still have to do everything I do. But we run around chasing the God of this world. And I'm telling you, the God of this world is green paper. Amen. I don't know if you've ever been to my house, but it's a nice house. In fact, it's a beautiful house. If you haven't been to my house lately, it's a beautiful home. I have a beautiful home. I have a beautiful dining room. I have a nice kitchen. I have a nice uh, study. I have a beautiful bedroom. I drive a decent car. I got a beautiful lifestyle. You, you say, man, preacher, well, how'd that happen? 18 years ago, I decided to serve God. 18 years ago. Listen, I opened a book this morning, Miss Van Zulen. Dave Gibbs wrote a book. I opened it up. I had I wrote something down. I stated it. I wrote it down in February. No. April 1st, 1994, before the church had even started. I hadn't even read that paper. I didn't. I forgot about that book. It's been sitting on a shelf for five years. I pulled it down this morning just to read through it real quick. And I found that paper, and it, here's what it said. It said, I am committed to starting a church in Fort Wayne, and nothing will stop me. Amen. Five years ago, I found it. I hadn't even started the church yet. Five, uh, five years ago, I wrote, almost five years ago, I wrote that paper. What, boy, that made me, it made me cry, really. But how good you say, oh boy, you no. Amen. Why? Because I decided if God be God, I'm gonna serve him. And these old fellows were all said, We're gonna throw you in a furnace. The king got furious. Wasn't used to these fellows being people of conviction. They didn't like a real Christian. They won't bow, they won't compromise, they won't bend, they won't change, they won't quit. Read about I'll tell you this too. Fox's Book of Martyrs. You ever read that book? All they tell them to do, Lenny, is recant. Remember that? Remember, Anthony? Recant. And that's all the world wants you to do. Compromise. We don't want you to come be a dopehead. We don't want you to come be a drunkard. We don't, you, we don't want you to quit church. We don't want you not to go to church. We don't want you to not to love God. We just want you to recant that firm conviction you have. Just kind of ease up. That's all the world wants. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, if, but he said, King, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O King. But if not, but if not, be it known unto thee, O King, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Amen. You decide, number one, to do right. Decide, number two, based on the Bible, what's right. Decide, number three, do regardless of how you feel to do right. Number four, last point. Decide regardless of how it turns out to do right. Decide regardless of how it turns out to do right. And by the way, decide to do right regardless of what others say or think. Peer pressure will do more to hinder you if you allow it than all the demons in hell. Peer pressure, teenager. Peer pressure, RJ. Peer pressure, peer pressure, peer pressure, Donna. Peer pressure will do more to hinder you, Carla, and uh, Mandy and Matt, I don't know. We haven't talked to you a lot lately. I don't know about your relatives. I don't know what your folks think about you going to church. I don't know what your brothers and sisters and all your friends think about going to church. Four weeks in a row you've been here. Amen. Four weeks in a row. Peer pressure will especially come to a church like this with a guy like me because I ain't like Fort Wayne's most popular preacher. I'm Fort Wayne's best preacher. Amen. Amen. That's right, preacher. Amen. I don't mean best. Wait a minute. I didn't say best speaker. I didn't say best pulp uh, sermon deliverer. And I bind you one thing. Nobody wins more souls in Fort Wayne than I do, preachers than I do. No, I promise you that. You mark that down. Fort Wayne's best human? No. Fort Wayne's uh, smart? No. Fort Wayne's best, uh, uh, I'll tell you one thing. I bet you nobody prays for their people like I do. Amen. If you're sitting in this room today, your name got called, unless you're a visitor. Unless you're a visitor, your name got called in prayer. You say, little kids, little kids, your children every day. And it'll, it'll keep going. You say, pat yourself on the back? No, I just decided to serve God. I decided it was right. See, I decided you're supposed to pray. I decided a pastor was supposed to pray for his people. Amen? Amen. You know, I decided that according to the Bible, and I decided to do it how I feel or not. And I, I'm going to decide to keep doing it no matter how it turns out. Amen. Now, you decide to do right no matter how it turns out or what others say or think. Peer pressure do more to stop you. When I first got saved, my old friend said, hypocrite, didn't matter. I'd already chosen God. First went to work. After a few weeks and months, they called me reverend, put stuff in my locker, trashed my locker. Didn't bother me. I'd already chosen. 
after I'd been saved and a Christian for six years and my house was destroyed by fire when I was in college, but it didn't matter. I'd already chosen. After I'd been saved nine years and I had to make a choice between ministry or money, it wasn't a choice to make in the valid decision because it didn't matter because I'd already chosen. When I came here, one guy said there's too many churches. When I came here, one guy said this town won't take strong preaching. Oh, this town didn't, it didn't have any strong preaching. That was a problem. Uh, when, when, I, when I came here in December of 1993, one guy told me nobody gets saved during the daytime. <laughs> isn't that funny? A so-called soul-winning evangelist said, nobody gets saved in the daytime. Thank you for your encouragement. <laughs> uh, what, what are you trying to do? Tell me I shouldn't come here? Tobiah. Amen. Book of Nehemiah. One guy said this, man, how old are you? Told him how old I was. He said, man, how many, you got how many kids? You're too old. You have too many kids to start a church. Well, I, I just checked with my records. I've led over 500 people to Christ myself since I got here. I decided to follow Jesus 12 years ago before, and regardless of what others said or did or thought, I was going to start a church for the glory of Jesus Christ. In the next few months, we'll have our 14,500th person saved. And uh, just last Sunday, we baptized our 1,700th person. Amen. <laughs> I guess nobody gets, I guess I shouldn't have started the church. We've only had almost 15,000, and that's not counting funerals, that's not counting a whole bunch of stuff. Almost 15,000 people saved, 1,700 baptized. Why? I decided to do what I thought God told me to do, regardless of how it was going to turn out, regardless of what other people say. I don't have to decide about what Bible to use. That was the side when I made my decision in the valley. I don't have to decide about being faithful to church or tithing or going soul winning or having standards or being separated from the world or forgiving my enemies or praying or being loyal to friends. I don't have to decide about any of those things because it was decided when I decided if God be God, follow him. I don't have to decide about staying married. I don't have to decide about rearing my children biblically. I don't have to decide on staying on a, uh, I shouldn't have to decide about staying on a bus route or keep teaching a Sunday school class. Why? Because when you decide, when you choose, when you get on the Lord's side, those things are predecided for you. All you must decide to do is follow Jesus. And by the way, in this time, those who did not decide to stay on God's side, in each instance, the decisions had tragic results and consequences. You may be in the value of decision today and you will decide, is it God? Is God God? Then follow him. If, if, if Baal is God, if the world's God, if the world has more to offer you, then follow the world. And that's what God said. And those who decided not to follow God and follow the world had tragic results and consequences. The people of Joshua's day, the people of Moses' day, the people in Elijah's day all faced the decision. The people in Joel's day, in Jeremiah's day, in Jesus' day all had to decide would they follow God or not. And you have to decide it too. Now today, stop deciding and decide. Stop trying to figure out what you'll have to give up. Stop trying to figure out what you'll have to do and decide to follow God. Now, somebody asked me last week, I don't think I've mentioned this to anybody. Somebody asked, last, asked me last week, what do I have to do? What would I have to do to be a pastor? What would I have to do to be a preacher? Well, you better make sure, number one, that you're supposed to be a preacher because it means a whole lot. It means, it means just this sermon right here. It means decide today that's it. It's settled. I'm going to follow God. Wherever he leads me, I'll go. Wherever he takes me, I'll go. I've decided to follow Jesus. And if he walks down a dark path, I'm going to follow him. If he walks down a, a dangerous path, I'm going to follow him. If he walks down a bright, cheerful, glorious path, I'll follow him. But I'm going to follow Jesus wherever he goes. That's the first thing you've got to do to be a preacher. That's the, very, that's the number one thing. No, the education is important, yes. Uh, Bible study is important, yes. A little bit of knowledge, a little bit about word knowledge and s sentence structure and sermon building and uh, illustration, and yes, that's all important. A prayer life is, is major, is, you know, it's a vital component. But the, one of the, the biggest thing about deciding to be a preacher or a pastor or an evangelist or a missionary is deciding to say, I have decided to follow Jesus. Amen. Now, you make your decision for God. Get out of the valley of decision. Stop deciding and decide. And by the way, if you don't make the right decision, you'll end up backsliding. And if you backslide, how far will you go? Where will you stop? Will you slide back further than you were when you first got saved? Will you go maybe, maybe even farther than that? How far will sin take you? I know this sin takes you farther than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. 
and it treats you like you've never been treated before. Go ahead. Make the decision. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decisions, in the valley of decision. Joshua said, it seem evil to you? Do what you want. If it seem evil to you to serve God, don't serve him. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Choose you this day. Now, Joshua said to the people, choose today. Moses said to the people, if you're on his side, get over here. Elijah said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If not, follow Baal. You'll never make a better decision in your life than decide to live for Jesus Christ. You'll never make a decision that will give you more joy than deciding to live for Jesus Christ. You'll never make a decision that will give you more peace or more satisfaction or more confidence or more direction or more purpose than to live for Jesus Christ. I have a purpose. Man, I can't wait. I love life. I can't wait to get up in the morning. I told Miss Jackson last night. I said, man, I, I wish I didn't have to go to bed. I set my clock for 3.30. You know, we went to bed at 10 o'clock. I couldn't go to sleep for half an hour. I couldn't wait to get up. Why? I was thinking about today. 3 o'clock went off 3.30. Man, I couldn't wait to get up. You say, that's the preacher, don't you like to sleep? I like sleeping. I like sleeping. But listen to me. I, I wanted to get up this morning because I said I get to pray. You say, that's all. Hey, stop talking. Hey, 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 hey. Stop talking. I love you. It's that mood swing again. I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to get up. I couldn't wait to get up. I couldn't wait to get up. Why? I, I got. I knew what I was going to happen when I got up. I was going to put my dogs out in the front yard. They're going to go into Leo's yard and take care of business. Then they were going to come back into my into the house and, and everything. And then I was going to go back in my study and in my closet and shut my door. And when I get in your closet and shut your door, pray your Father which is heaven and your Father which is in heaven. Here's your prayer. The Bible says you pray your Father is the secret. He'll reward thee openly. And I knew I got to go talk to God. Then I got to read my Bible. I knew what I was reading, too. I read the whole book of Ecclesiastes and part of Proverbs. I got to read my Bible. Then I got to study. I love it. I love it. I love it. Why? You say, that doesn't sound very, sounds kind of boring to me, preacher. I, I know. Maybe you, you're still in the valley of decision. Amen. Now, if you're in the valley of decision day, you decide to live for Christ. Decide. Nothing will give you more of a purpose, more confidence, more direction than living for Christ. I said, number one, decide if something's right to do it. Number two, decide according to the word of God. Number three, decide regardless of how you feel. Number four, decide regardless of how it turns out or what others think or say. Now, where are you today? Where are you today? Where are you today? Two man preachers, you hurt me today because I know I'm not doing what I ought to do. Well, then do it. Then do it. It's up to you. The choice is you. You think, oh, I'd have to it'd be so hard. It'd not be hard. It'd be simple. Be easy. He said, if it seem evil, is it this? I'm quoting right now. Is it this? Does it seem evil to else I promise you becomes clearer to you as you follow that shining light I promise you according to the Bible you decide to follow him today won't you do it let's pray together